Hi, I'm Kevin Cummings. At Investors Bank, we believe in helping our local neighborhoods and improving the lives of all we serve. We're a different bank that makes a difference for our employees, clients, and communities. That's why we're proud to support public television and the programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by the Fidelco Group, Investors Bank, New Jersey Natural Gas, proud to support education in our communities, Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, New Jersey Sharing Network, dedicated to saving lives through organ and tissue donation, Verizon Communications, and by the New Jersey Education Association. Promotional support provided by NJ.com. Small news, big news, true Jersey. And by NJ Biz. All business, all New Jersey. This is One on One. When you first heard that they were doing Charlie Rose and Gail King, didn't you go, what? People like laughing at others, so I don't mind if the other is me. See, you go right into the character. That's what it is. <laughs> I'm bringing families together a half an hour each week. Man, I'm doing something special. And so I do feel successful. Welcome to One on One. It is my pleasure to introduce for the first time in One on One, Dr. Lisa Tank, Chief, Chief of the Division of Geriatrics, Hackensack University Medical Center. Good to see you, doctor. Good to see you too, Steve. I should uh, tell folks, full disclosure, I've done some uh, executive leadership and communication coaching at Hackensack, and I've uh, talked to you in the past and worked with you. Uh, and one of the things I've learned when I talk to you about geriatrics is that there's some confusion about it. What is it? I think geriatrics um, is, if you look at aging itself, it's such a multidisciplinary field. And what it does, it looks at the whole person. It looks at different things such as biology, psychology, sociology. And there are two different things actually to geriatrics. There's ger gerontology, that's the science of aging. And that really focuses on the mental, mental physical well-being. But it also looks at economics, it looks at public policies, and it puts a whole team together, an interdisciplinary team. And that's professionals who call them gerontologists. Mm -hmm. While geriatrics is about health diseases, mm -hmm. providing a comprehensive, patient-centered, well-coordinated care. And what these two do together is really promote well-being of aging population in their communities, in their families, through education, through research. Dr. Let's talk and again, again in some of these conversations I have with you off air. I've been fascinated by, you know, I, I've talked to you about the fact that like millions of other Americans, my sisters and I deal with issues that our parents are dealing with. And I'm struck by how common it is. And we know what the issues our parents have. What are the most common issues, health-related issues, that older people are dealing with? I think the most common issues initially, I think if you look at patients and their families, is to really first get rid of the misconceptions of aging. What are they? And I think the most common misconception is that chronological age means physical age or things like if you get older, you're going to get frail. It doesn't mean that? It does not mean that. So our goal we is... We are not our age? We are what we, what we feel inside and what <laughs> our mind is. So. Hold on, I'm going to write this down. Are you saying <laughs> that... I'm going to get this straight. Yes. Are you saying that... I'm going to play this out. Someone who is 75, right. but in their head feels 64, whatever that means, because they exercise. And they, right. Someone who is actually younger chronologically can feel and act much older. Absolutely. And therefore, and therefore quality of life. Quality of life and your goals and your dreams. All the things that you set out to do are very related to your mental and physical well-being. So you have to think, believe, and work towards those things. Devil's advocate. What about if someone says, well, that's great, doctor, but my attitude about aging is a product of my physical health. And if I'm experiencing you know, uh, arthritis, if mm -hmm. I'm experiencing certain ailments that are slowing me down, I can't do these things, you want me to have a younger, positive attitude, I can't because look at my condition, which is a product of age. Absolutely. And those are the patients we work with, and we start <laughs> way early on. And it's, all, it's almost a philosophy like stitch in time. So yes, arthritis is going to come with the joints getting older, 
But there are things you can do to delay those, to keep those uh, uh, knees and joints nimble, such as different types of exercises. Thinking of always exercising in four formats. Uh, Talk about once. that. So one is endurance, really getting those lungs and your cardiovascular system moving, such as walking briskly or mowing the lawn or swimming. Second is flexibility, that keeps you limber. Just think about it. If you're flexible, you're going to be able to bend down, tie your shoelaces. Third is strengthening and resistance that builds muscles, that gives you, protects your balance, um, gives you some strength, and that's going to help you, let's say, practically carry your groceries up the flight of stairs. And the fourth is balance, because balance is so yeah. important. It prevents falls. How common are falls among people who are older? It is very common. Actually, the CDC states that there'll be 30% of people over 70 and over sometimes having falls that lead to major injuries, especially head injuries, yes. falls and fractures. We had that in our family. It was stunning. It yes. was, and it shouldn't have been stunning because it is so common. Right. Some of it's avoidable? Um, as I always tell my patients, there are some things that are under your control, so take control especially your environment within your home. Yeah. Keep it safe, um, avoid loose rugs, keep enough <laughs> lighting, you know, have your grab bars. If you, if, if you had a magic wand, keep everything on one floor, that would help. Well, you know, just stay on that uh, without disclosing too much. In our home, one of the things we missed uh, with a very uh, important family member to us was when the fall happened, right. our family member did not have a bar because, you know, going to the rest, going to the bathroom in the middle of the night, did not have the bar to grab, number one. And number two, on the corners of the end table, we did not put any of those rubber corners. Oh, yes. And his head hit the corner, and then it was not good. Mm -hmm. We can control that. Yes, we can. Can't control whether he falls or not, but if, in fact, it happens, we can minimize the damage, right? Absolutely, and um, as you said to the point, what can you control? Even things of why you would fall are controllable. So that's why it's so important to see a geriatrician who looks at all your medications. You know, most of the time when people get up too fast, all the blood pools down to your legs. And if you're on multiple medications, your blood pressure is going to drop and you are going to get lightheaded. So all these little factors usually mm -hmm. tie in. You, you've also told me, before, and I want you to share mm -hmm. this now, how important it is to say socially active? Absolutely. Socially active keeps that brain agile. So you have your physical health by exercise, but you have your mental health. Stimulating that brain by staying around people, your friends, people who have common interests. Laughing is a great way to keep young. And what does that have to do with dealing with getting older in I a think, better way? I think if you look at humans in general, we are social. So staying isolated does what it does. It really slows down your brain synapses and the memory. It also affects your mood. While you, when you are around people that bring you joy or hobbies and interests that bring you joy, that's going to really trigger those synapses and also going to release your own hormones that keep you happy and motivated. Since we're talking about the brain, yes. uh, one of the other obvious issues I have to bring up deals with Alzheimer's, dementia. Mm -hmm. By the way, which is which? So Alzheimer's is a type of dementia. Got it. Uh, there are different types of dementia, and Alzheimer's is one of them. And as far as we know right now, it's related to inflammatory changes and plaques that get deposited in your brain. No cure. Right now, no cure, but the goal is the same way. You prevent heart disease, you prevent strokes, control that blood pressure, control those sugars if you're diabetic, exercise, get that blood flowing. What does that have to do with dealing with dementia? It, what it does, it really still helps your brain your, uh, to stay agile with memory because really what dementia does, it slows your ability to learn new things. And the brain is very simple. You don't use it, you lose it. It's the same thing if you have to practice things. So if you retire and now you do not have you know, structure to your day or you don't have any goals that are set and you don't have a purpose, you do notice that there is slowing down of memory. There is slowing down of ability to learn new things. So these are very important things, again. Bring it back to keep that brain active, keep that body active by exercising, and set some goals. You love what you do. I love it. You make a difference every day. Dr. Lisa Tank, That's Chief good. Division of Geriatrics, Hackensack University Medical Center. Thank you, doctor. Thank you so much for having me. Stay with us. We'll be right back right after this.
Thank you. To see more one-on-one -on -one with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at steveadubato.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD And follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. Everything you've ever wanted or needed to know about higher education, you're about to find out with our good friend, Dr. Kay Walter, president of Bergen Community College. Good to see you, Kay. Good to see you, Steve. Let's talk about um, the fact that we just had an interesting discussion. We're here in our studio, and we were able to talk to you and uh, three other college presidents who represent very different institutions. But the issue of cost generated a fascinating debate. You're concerned, aren't you? I'm extremely concerned uh, because we serve a student population that doesn't have money to go to college. These are not rich kids who just can have money to burn. These are kids who come from families where their parents work two, three, sometimes four jobs all the time right. just to put food on the table and a roof over their heads. So when a, when a kid, not even a kid, any person of any age, a student, starts to build up that kind of debt, right? Um, what kind of impact does it have in terms of not just the academic, the college experience, but the potential that that student just doesn't hang in and quits? If you look at your debt level and you see yourself building more and more debt and you know that you, the job that you get when you finish college it's not going to pay that debt off in any time period. Sure. You're going to start feeling frustrated and quit. That's why uh, we are trying really hard to build our foundation right now, more and more scholarships so that students don't have to take out loans. So they're e either able to go to college on, with financial aid right. or with a scholarship from our foundation because we are very concerned about the debt level of our students. But the other part of that that's important is you mentioned, you know, the whole idea of I'm here to learn, but I'm also here to increase the odds that I'll be able to compete in a very competitive job market, you know? Talk about the internships that you offer on your campus and its direct connection to increasing the odds that a student could be employed in the marketplace. I'll give you a, a really good example of an internship program that we have just started with Hackensack Medical Center, um, the John Thayer Cancer Center, right. to be exact. We started working this past year with um, three very bright physicians, Dr. Goldless, Dr. Singer, and Dr. Captan, who are neuro-oncologists and neurosurgeons. And they really need uh, databases built. And we have technology students who can build databases. So we've developed internship programs with them and are in the process uh, down the road of build, building databases for them. What does it do for them? And the, first of all, the students are building a database for the physicians as it relates to their it patients will, and will, patient is information. Go ahead, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, it will allow them to really uh, take a look at the research that they're doing on all of the new kinds of drug therapies uh, and different uh, protocol for treating brain cancer. So it's, it's really um, an honor for us to be partnering with them. Not only are they providing internships for our students, but they also have been coming to campus and giving lectures for our students. The physicians? The physicians. What does that do for the students? Uh, the students call them their rock stars. Wow. Uh, these are students who want to be physicians, who want uh, to be business people and work in the medical professions. They see this as an opportunity to connect with the work that they're going to be doing in the future. It's a big part of... Uh... Bergen Community College, as I've learned more and more about your campus, the whole idea of partnering, partnerships. You have a relationship, is, was it, is it with Bergen Votech? It's with Bergen Technical School. What, what is that about, and why, how does that impact your students in a positive way? We talked earlier today about finances. With the college presidents, right. With the college presidents, and you and I talked a little bit about it as we started this discussion. 
One of the things that our community colleges can do is partner with our technical schools, which we've done for a new applied technology degree. Applied technology, technology degree. degree. Go ahead. So we're going to have an early college class beginning 2015 on our campus that will be students from the technology high school. They will be our students and their students at the same time. When they finish their high school degree in four years, they will have also finished their first year of college. Our faculty and their faculty will be co-teaching classes together and supporting these students so that financially they're going to have a year of college paid for when they finish and they'll only have a year left to go to finish their uh, associate's degree. Okay, so come down to the fact that, that college, whether it's a two-year institution or a four-year institution, that the entire college experience at your place and others, particularly at your place for this conversation, requires that an institution of higher learning goes outside of its walls and partners with healthcare systems like you described at Hackensack or uh, Bergen, Votec, and obviously others, that you can't just say it's all here on campus. It doesn't work that way. That's, Steve, why we have the name community in our name. We are a community college, and we partner with uh, our community businesses, our community K-12 through partners, and our university partners, so that everyone has access to an education in the most affordable and successful way. Final topic. Um, the whole question of readiness, student readiness, we also talked about in that College President's Roundtable. I want to uh, delve into this a little bit more in the time we have with you. Why is it that so many students enter college so ill-prepared or just simply not prepared to do what they have to do to forget about compete, survive? We're finding that most of our first-generation students are not prepared to transition into college. As long as we give them preparation and we've begun our new summer intensive program with our students, we prepare them to leave high school and to be ready uh, to enter college level courses. So first the whole question is they're coming from high school into Bergen and then from Bergen to a four year school. Go ahead, play it out. So when they finish high school, if they're at risk, we put them in our summer intensive program. We do. What do you do with them? We do all sorts of things. We have volunteers from the community again who come in and assist us. We have mentors for the students. We teach them study skills. We prepare them to take placement tests. Uh, we teach them about how they learn, whether uh, they're an auditory learner, uh, whether they like kinesthesis, whether they would prefer just to take an online class and be happy doing that. You actually, there's, it sounds like they're survival skills for higher education. Well, of course there are. There's sur survival skills for every college And there's student. no reason to assume that, that a person can just enter in and succeed. They need, we need help. We all need help. Dr. Kay Walter, president of uh, Bergen Community College, one of the 19 community colleges in the state. Kay, thank you so much. Thank you, Steve. Appreciate it. Stay with us. We'll be right back right after this. Thank you, Kay. To see more one-on-one -on -one with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at steveadubato.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD, and follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. There she is, Debbie Kaminsky, founder of Newark Yoga Movement. How are you doing? I'm fantastic. <clears throat> look at me trying to get, Bob, take a look at this. Take a wide shot. Can you pull back? I'm trying to get my leg in this position. I am ridiculously inflexible. I've told you about that. Am I, are most guys this way? Most guys say, I can't do yoga. I'm not flexible. That's what they, it's true. I was about to say that to you. Yeah, true I or know. not? Uh, I'd say it's true, however, I'd say that it's always a benefit if you're not flexible because you're actually keeping yourself safe. Okay, you're not stretching we, too before far. Before we talk about me and other guys, what's up with the Newark Yoga thing? You, you've been at this since? Six years. 
How did it start and why? It started in 2009 because I saw what was going on with the education system in Newark and nobody was graduating or not enough people were graduating and I felt that the benefits of yoga could really help the benefits of educating our children and getting them out of school. So uh, through working with the politicians and getting into the schools, and you know what that's like, it's a huge bureaucracy, we did pilot testing that was very successful, and we started knocking on doors in the Newark school system, Newark public schools, charter schools, and also the private schools. And flashing forward to today, now in year six, we have somehow taught 16,000 children yoga. What? Yeah, I know. It's 16,000? 16,000 children How, yoga. How, where? Do you go into the schools? We go into the schools. I like to do things in a required environment, so it's either in the phys ed class or in the right. classroom, and we try to take over an entire school. Wow. So, so we have, if you would, this is another crazy number, 100 classes running a week in Newark in Who the schools. Who does it? We have a, a gazillion teachers that have come through our system. You They're train all, them? We actually, they're all trained teachers, but we all, we make sure that they're okay in the particular school. We don't just say, hey, Steve, you want to teach for us? Sure, go into a school. Yeah. Uh, we work with them very closely until they're ready to go into the school, and then they go off and start teaching the students. What do these young people get out of it, Debbie? Oh, my goodness. They get... Um, Anger management issue or anger management control. They get stress relief. They get peacefulness. They get focus. They get major confidence. Um, we've worked with children that you know they say I can, I can, I can, and we say you're not allowed to use the word can anymore because yoga is something that if you try your best, you're doing it right. And what's happened is all of a sudden they do a yoga pose that they never thought they'd be able to do, and they take that with them and translate it off the mat into their life. What's it done for you? Well, it's actually, uh, it's made me a much more grounded individual. I spent many years in the advertising world before turning to yoga, and that is extremely stressful. You know, it was working 24-7 sometimes, depending on if you had a pitch or what was going on with the client meeting, and I was always strung out, even though I worked out. I think mm -hmm. yoga really mm -hmm. brought my mind to peace, and I think every single person in the entire universe could use that. Talk about uh, our friends Mark and, or, and Carrie Burson. Mm -hmm. uh, talk to us about you because Mark started the Opportunity Project, right? Yes. Tell folks everyone, everyone what that is and also how you have brought your work there. Okay, so Opportunity Project is this clubhouse that is for people who have suffered traumatic brain injury. And I think what is so fantastic about it is it makes everybody feel like they're just a perfectly normal human being. And I could say that with the yoga, we have yoga running there once a week now. Mm. I teach it personally, and it has been an incredible experience for me, working with um, some people who are paralyzed on part of their body, tracheotomies. It doesn't matter. Everybody gets something out of the yoga. And we have seen people who haven't lifted their arms up in years now lifting their arms up. Because yoga is something that if it really gets into your mind, it really helps you look at things in a positive way versus in that negative way, cultivating positivity. How, how much there is the reaction? It's interesting. <clears throat> I, I've mentioned to you, I've tried it a couple of times, mm -hmm. many times actually, and I wanted to be open to it. Right. Without getting too into the details. But then I was like, you know, it's not for me. I don't know if I stayed with it long enough, and now I go to this flexibility trainer who's right. been great with me. Right. But I also, for the most part, I was uncomfortable being with a group of other people and being the one who couldn't do the poses. Right. So I actually, uh, we have that happen a lot. I'd say more with adults or when we're in the school system, if it's children that are maybe much bigger children than sure. everybody else. And we say over and over again, if you try your best, you're doing it right. Yoga is something that is an individual thing. It you is don't not, win anything. You win There's nothing. no competition. You win by trying your best. That's what you do. You get it right by trying your mm. best because you get the benefits right away. If you just started breathing in the yoga kind of way for less than a minute, you're going to all of a sudden start firing up the you know, acids in your brain and everything's going to shift in a positive way. Actually, believe it or not, because I, I learned something about yoga, I'm actually breathing that way right now. 
because there's that breathing, that deeper breathing. That the comes Ujjayi from, breathing? Yeah. Yeah. It actually does calm you down. Yeah, Why? It does because. Does it mess with your brain? It does. It messes with your brain. There's actually um, the cortisol levels can be reduced and the GABA levels can be, be increased. What? And yeah. <laughs> they have. It came out of Boston Medical School. It's amazing. And mm. the GABA levels is what really um, makes somebody too anxious or depressed. And so if you can increase them, yeah. you now create a sense got of calm. about a minute and a half left. Can you do this for me? Yeah, I don't know sure. if I'm ever going back permanently, but can you do this? I've got a bunch of PBS or public television uh, spots I'm supposed to do after this. Long day. We've been taping for eight, nine right. hours. I'm a little stressed. Right. But before I do these other things, can you show me a couple of things as we Absolutely. go out to the... Can Absolutely. we do this? Can we do this, guys? Bob Morris, our director, and, and sure. Jen. Jen so won't be mad at me. You want to do it right here? Yeah. Okay, so the first thing, let's just, we'll do two things. We have less than a minute. Let's yes. do two things. So let's put your hands on your thighs. Take a deep breath in through your nose. Feel your side ribs expand. And then exhale, sink your bottom back so you feel like you're sitting on an invisible chair. Yes. And now inhale, open your chest. This is called cow pose. If you were a kindergartner, we'd have you moo. And then exhale, round your spine. So that's just working your back right now. And then inhale, open your spine, open your heart. Exhale, round your spine. What's that doing for me? Wow, it's That's working up your my back. back, yeah. Wow. And then inhale, stand up tall. So when you have a closed heart, it actually goes right to lower back pain. Wow, it just open, when you open I've been it. Sitting yeah. all day, and it just opened yeah. it up. All right, let's try the forward bend and see if we can straighten You're out those hamstrings. You're not doing downward dog? No, we're not going to do downward dog. I just want to say downward dog. OK, yeah. good. I have a client that calls it a dirty dog, but we won't don't, go don't there. Don't do that. Okay. It's public television. Inhale What's your wrong arms with up. you? It's All just right. dirty. Inhale your arms up overhead. Okay, here you go. All right. Now, lead with that chest that you open. Exhale, fold forward. Bend your knees. Plant your hands on the floor. And then let your head go. And now keep pressing your hands. Inhale, straighten your legs a little. Keep your hands flat on the floor. Yes. Keep breathing. Steve, Deep can you breath see me, in. Steve Barsi? Yeah. Keep breathing. Deep breath in. Deep breath out. And then slowly inhale. Come all the way up. All the way up. Bring your hands right to your heart. We always end everything with the word namaste. Namaste. I Boy, see you think the I good gotta remember in you. these things? I see the good in you. You see the good in me. We see the good in each other. Thank you. Namaste. This all is right. Debbie. One on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by the Fidelco Group, Investors Bank, New Jersey Natural Gas, Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, New Jersey Sharing Network, Verizon Communications, and by the New Jersey Education Association. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. Hi, I'm Eric. You might see me as an ordinary person, but I've been living with a brain injury for nearly two years. One of my struggles is short-term memory loss. At Opportunity Project, I'm given hope and support, and I've gained my comments back through the job placement program. Despite my challenges, I have a reason to keep improving. Today, even though life has changed me, I believe that anything is possible. If you have a brain injury, you don't have to face your road to recovery alone.